So, um, hello everyone, doing another episode of Keep Calm, It's Just a Snake podcast. Today we have a really cool guest here. We have Creatures of Nightshade. They do some amazing work with, um, excuse me as I end up crunching on the end of a little cough drop, getting over a cold. Um, they do amazing work with a bunch of very hard to keep, rare, uncommon snakes, and they have done an amazing job about not only keeping them, but cultivating a bunch of data and being able to actually teach other people how to keep them. So without further ado, how you doing? Hi there, guys. I'm Scarlet Nightshade. Um, I'm pretty much the backbone of Creatures of Nightshade. Me and my husband, Abel, uh, we both uh, pretty much you know, invested everything into our snakes and our animals. So we're really excited to be here. Nice. So have you been on a podcast before? I have not. I am actually, uh, I kind of have a bit of a social anxiety, to be honest, just a little bit. Um, okay. So I don't make a lot of appearances, but I'm kind of working towards, you know, getting over that. And this is a good way to, to start doing that. So. Cool. Well, hopefully this goes pretty well then. I just think of this kind of like we're, you know, like at a reptile show or something, we're just talking shop. Mm-hmm. So um, how did you get started in the world of animals, but more specifically reptiles? So I've always had a natural curiosity towards animals. Um, in fact, so much so that when I was 13, I thought I was part wolf uh, for several years. Um, I grew up in a pretty conventional household. Um, exotics like reptiles were just not, you know, they were more looked down upon. But um, I hadn't had the opportunity to actually get to work with the animals I wanted to work with until about 17 or so. Um, and then at this point in time, I explored several different outlets from wanting to be an astrophysicist to a veterinarian to an engineer, artist, so on and so forth. Um, uh, interestingly, though, through all of this uh, self-discovery, if you will, I uh, we, we found a creatures of nightshade in a very organic and spontaneous matter. We were watching a interview um with Slash, uh, the guitar player for Guns N' Roses, and he has, yeah, he has a bunch of, obviously, a bunch of really cool snakes. He had a boa coiled real comfortable around his neck, and me and my husband were on the couch. We looked at one another, and we didn't even have to say anything. We immediately knew that we wanted to get a snake. So it started with a Mexican black king snake named Apophis, who we still have today, and um, he basically changed our lives. He sparked a passion. We that ignited our business, that ignited Creatures of Nightshade. He was so friendly and gentle, amazing. Just we were amazed by every aspect of his existence. So, he, yeah, he, he started that up. And uh, over time, we uh, created what we call our slithery family. So <laughs> that's really cool. So um, can I ask why Creatures of Nightshade? Like why that name specifically? Yeah. So we actually went through a lot of different uh, phases with the name. Uh, it started pretty, pretty plainly with Great Lake Snakes, found out another business had that name, moved on from that. Then we were uh, Nightshade Serpents. My uh, for, last name is Nightshade. Our, our family name is Nightshade. So, <clears throat> so we had uh, Nightshade Serpents. And for a while, we actually branched into Manises and Jeweled Lacertas. Uh, ended up going back to just snakes, but um, that's kind of what started with creatures in Nightshade. We kept it because, you know, I don't know, we kind of delve into other animals um, a bit here and there. Uh, falconry is something I'm working on pursuing. Um, you oh, know, we cool. keep we keep frogs and the tadpoles and stuff like that. So that's pretty much how that started, just to encompass all the creatures that we work with and then our family name. So. Oh, that's really cool. I have to come back to the falconry thing. I'm actually very good friends with a general falconer who runs a wildlife education program here. That's in the awesome. That I'm in. So, That's yeah, awesome. I, I, yeah, it's really cool. It's I really like that aspect. Of mm -hmm. it. So absolutely. Well, if we have time, we'll circle back to that. Okay. It's, it's, it's really fun. So, you know, with creatures of night shade, as you said before, just kind of like how a lot of us end up doing where we kind of evolve into not only working with what we enjoy and what works for us, but also kind of like our theme and our main focus and kind of what we want to put out there. Um, you've now kind of established yourselves as kind of this cornerstone of keeping a very rare and very cool type of snake, that being the dragon snake. Yes. Um, so I knew that I wanted to keep dragon snakes from the moment right. we pretty much got into reptiles. But, of course, I was aware of, you know, the challenges of keeping them. Um, I wanted to wait until I felt confident 
working with them, knowing that, you know, I could give them the highest chance I possibly could to thrive. Um, been over four years ago now, um, after I had earned a little bit of experience, well, a lot of experience working with uh, various wild card imports, um, paradise flying snakes, I had kept, you know, wild caught like corn snakes and stuff, but paradise flying snakes, um, I've kept wild caught beauty snakes, uh, wild caught, there's a species called Pataya, uh, Pataius that, uh, relatively or, well really rare um asian species that i kept mm-hmm. um uh house snakes etc um several years doing that i felt confident that eventually you know uh, i reached the point where i could keep dragon snakes so i started out with a pair a freshly imported pair um and i decided that from the minute that i got them i decided that i was going to keep very extensive documentation there was there was really no information on them available, especially at, at that time. There, it was essentially non-existent. So I decided to document everything with the intent of studying them, observing them, learning from them, and eventually hoping to share that experience. Um, I did lose uh, one of the dragon snakes from that initial pair after eight months and 12 days. Um, but anyone that's worked with wild caught imports for any really substantial period of time has experienced the loss. It's an inevitability, unfortunately, you know, it just happens. So I didn't, I didn't let that loss, um, be the defining moment where I was like, okay, this can't be done. The other one, um, is still thriving today along with, uh, we have uh, 15 others that are, that are thriving. Yeah. we've, (laughs) We've, we've definitely added to the group. Um, and actually recently we added, uh, another group of eight or 10 and four of them were little itty bitty babies that were no bigger than about that very first time that I ever got a word. I mean, they had to be less than probably two to three months old, like just hatched in the wild. And I've never gotten to work with uh, little, little fellers like that. So that was really exciting. They're doing great. They're actually doing, they established so much quicker than any of my sub adults or adults. So it, it gives me a lot of um, uh, hope for eventually when we're hoping to produce captive bred offspring. And it um, gives me a lot of hope that the captive bred offspring will thrive because those little guys, you would think they're captive bred. They're so curious. They're like, they, they have no fear of humans. They're like, they'll sit there waiting at their water container, like looking up, like you're going to drop the tadpoles in there. Or like it's, it's great. They're adorable. They're great. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah. They're, they're amazing in that aspect. Um, just they're really great snakes. That's so cool. So, so as you, you know, kind of got kind of laid down the groundwork a little bit. So they all come in as wild caught imports. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, a lot of stuff that we've told about them is that, you know, they like it cool. They like it damp and dark mm-hmm. and they don't like being messed with it. All, Absolutely. Like, at all, at all, like even more than like the Mexican burrowing python. Absolutely. In fact, um, you know, their husbandry requirements are probably the, the most simple aspect of keeping them. Like you said, high humidity around 90 percent. Um, Low heat, uh, no more than between about 72 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, 22 to 24 degrees Celsius. Um, if, if you're in, obviously, you know, you're not in America, <laughs> but yeah, um, anywhere else. <laughs> right. Uh, which I wish we adopted that system. But anyway, uh, yeah, plenty of moss, plenty of hides, um, shelter. Uh, I guess the, the one aspect of keeping them, you know, their diet is, Pretty unique among snakes where they required, you know, tadpoles and frogs is the primary source of their diet. But um, I, I honestly think that the high mortality rate has a lot more to do with either one of two things. Of course, keepers lack of knowledge of the species. Um, you know, now it's becoming more known that, you know, there's difficulties in keeping them and whatnot. But um I think a lot of it has to do with that, but the other side of it, I think a lot of people tend to overcomplicate their care um, in the sense where, you know, I get a lot of people that, that will come to me when they're asking about their husbandry and whatnot, and I love bioactive enclosures. They're amazing. Um, for wild-caught snakes, especially with dragon snakes, I try, when I first get them established, I try to make sure that I keep their husbandry and their enclosure as relatively simple as possible that way if something does go wrong there's less factors that you're dealing with in order to understand okay well how can i improve it when you have a massive 
or I shouldn't say massive because they don't get any longer than like two and a half feet. But when you right. have a, an elaborate enclosure and all these um, smaller elements that, you know, are kind of contributing to how complicated their setup and their care is it. If you don't, you know, if you haven't kept the species for a very long time, if you, it's your first time keeping them, um, I would recommend always keeping it a bit more simple than that just to start off and then slowly increasing. Like if you want to add a nice water feature instead of using like a little container, absolutely. I'm working towards doing that myself. Um, adding, uh, um, obviously you don't want to add any overhead heat or lights or anything like that. They're, they're pretty nocturnal, um, somewhat fossorial, but, uh, yeah, the climbing enrichment and stuff like that is, is great once they're more established and more comfortable in their environment. But the, the more you can make it simple where you basically have a couple hides, a lot of moss and a water dish just to start out in a dark, quiet room, that's the best way to start doing it. Because otherwise, you know, if, if there's just so much going on, they may not be able to even find where their food is at first because they're a little nervous. They don't really know where they're at or what's going on. But, um, but yeah, starting out simple is great. And I, with a really simple setup just to start out, they always eat, they always do great. Um, and they really thrive because I think the biggest, uh, aspect with dragon snakes is that they're fragile in the sense that when they're stressed, they won't eat. And when they don't eat, they lose body condition very quick, very, very quickly. Um, because they're just, they're small, they're sensitive in that aspect. And, um, if they don't eat, you know, they, they'll die. They'll die really, really, really quickly. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing is if you can't get them eating within the first month or two, you know, the, the chance of them thriving really goes down because they're just not maintaining the body condition that they need to, especially after being imported and not eating that whole time. I mean, you know, the import process alone is, is very taxing on them. So yeah, just keeping things simple, quiet, dark, don't handle them whatsoever. No vet visits. Um, I don't even, really medicate mine if I if I don't have a reason to anymore I used to treat all my wild caught imports for parasites upon arrival I don't do that anymore just because it's I observe them if they're not eating if something seems wrong then I go about it that way but now with dragon snakes in particular I I just let them settle in in a dark quiet room and then I feed them after about a week and they eat like crazy so they're they're quite they're they're pretty big pigs once you get the right diet for them and get them settled in so cool so as you mentioned before, that it's like tadpoles and frogs are their staple diets. Mm-hmm. So for um, so for a lot of people, when we think tadpoles, at least here in the states, we usually think of like bullfrog tadpoles, yep. which would probably be very large for a small dragon snake. Believe it or not, I, no, I used to feed almost exclusively tree frog tadpoles, um, okay. and then tree frog frogs. I tried breeding them. It's not easy to breed the tree frog and they take a while to mature. I um actually source mine offline. I buy just straight tadpoles. I establish them, grow them up as frogs and just keep make sure I have a new fresh group of tadpoles to raise up. Um and then the bullfrog tadpoles I actually just got a fresh shipment of them today. Um they are much too large for like little little guys, but for adult right. females, they can fit a lot in their little mouths, man. You would be surprised. <laughs> the like I mean, their little heads are like the female's head is probably not much bigger than my thumbnail. I don't know if I can and I I mean, she will eat a bullfrog tadpole where his head is like this big. Wow. It's crazy. Yeah, the babies can't eat them, but if you get younger bullfrog tail, like no longer than probably three to four inches, I would say, they'll the adult females will chow those right down. And it's great for them. I like feeding the tadpoles more than frogs just because the frogs are, you know, they're little jumpy things and the dragon right. snakes like you can almost see them. They're like, really, a frog that I got to chase? Like, this is why <laughs> this is why I'm in captivity. I shouldn't have to chase my food. Just drop it in the water dish. <laughs> they definitely um, they definitely uh eat better i think on the tadpoles just because the frogs i think they're like no let's wait till she gives me tadpoles i'm not even gonna go bother to hunt for it it's funny but but yeah yeah Mm -hmm. oh geez that's that's hilarious Have, have they ever taken to any other type of prey item yeah so i actually just finished a study um i used to feed my dragon snakes a 50 50 diet of uh guppies in particular like mosquito fish platies mollies etc um of those and then tadpoles it was like a kind of a 50 50 mix um i did a two and a half or no a two year sorry two year study that i just finished july uh 
I can't remember, July something of last month, or, well, now two months ago, right. um, <laughs> where I compared, I had uh, 12 dragon snakes, I divided them into uh, uh, three different groups of four, and I fed uh, one group um, just tadpoles, I fed the other group just fish, and I fed the other group a 50-50 mix of tadpoles and fish. And I actually uh, observed them, tracked everything, and I found out, at least through observ- you know clinical observations, that <laughs> the fish are, you know, for one reason or another, I, I assume because of thiaminase, which I can uh, cover that a little bit more uh, later, but um, they're not nutritionally, they're almost like nutritionally deficient i guess for dragon snakes to be an exclusive or even a 50 50 mix prey item so um their body condition deteriorated from just being fed the fish um and and now all of them you know between molly's platies mosquito fish etc their body condition just kept going down they were more lethargic not as alert as they usually are not as um curious not you know they, eventually they were refusing meals you know some of them so after that, I decided to feed almost exclusively tadpoles with maybe a little bit of fish mixed in. Um, and I think a lot of that, again, is due to the thiaminase, which is a, it is a enzyme that essentially breaks down thiamine or uh, vitamin uh, B12. I think yep. it's B12. Yeah, I vitamin B12. Yeah, and uh, which is crucial for any living being to carry out its necessary bodily functions. So when it breaks that down, it breaks the dragon snake down. And I think that might have a lot to do with it. I can't confirm that with any scientific accuracy because I didn't measure any thiaminase levels or anything like that. But I think that has a a big role in it. So I stopped. I mean, my feeder tank, I my colony's at about 50 right now, and I'll probably only feed off maybe out for a group of 15, 16 snakes. Um, I'll probably only feed off a few a week just to offer a little variety. But they really like the tadpoles and frogs. Um the fish are sometimes like they'll leave them alone if there's like lots of tadpoles in there and there's a couple fish they're like I'm not even gonna bother they don't I think they just prefer the tadpoles and frogs it's definitely better for them nutritionally as well so okay so for like I'm I'm learning this as well a little bit because I have a small group of baby rhino rat snakes and getting them established they, that's awesome that's what, I love that species they, that's what they eat are the, like the little fish and the frogs. Um, until eventually we can get them onto mice and then bearing up their diets Mm -hmm. along the road. Um, And I'm learning that that is a giant pain in the butt. Um, Mm -hmm. How is um, just like, just because like also to kind of settle my mind a little bit, even a bit too, um, dealing with having to constantly deal with like clean water sources, fresh water sources with having in live tadpoles and fish sometimes at the same time continuously like, does that become stressful for the animals with having to, like, check on them every day? Is it kind of a chore to deal with, like, the water quality and things like that? Yeah, so I've um I've been keeping fish for longer than I've been keeping snakes. Um, and I the way that I do it is um, when I put them in the in the water basin for the dragon snakes, mm-hmm. um, I do mix the tadpoles and the fish together, but. Uh, the dragon snakes, I give them about two, sometimes three days, depending to eat. When they don't eat, I put um, the non-eaten, if if anything's not eaten, which usually it isn't. But if there is, there's like little, you know, if there's a couple fish that weren't eaten, I'll put the fish in a hospital tank, their own tank of their own to recover. And then I let them, you know, um, start eating, getting healthy if they lost any mass from, you know. Um, right. In terms of the cleanliness of the water, I definitely – I keep my tanks very – I keep them as I would a pet, essentially, where mm-hmm. um, I don't do any overcrowding. There's no more than – in a in a 10-gallon tank, I usually only keep about 15 uh, fish. And then tadpoles can live in, in greater uh, quantities and within closer proximity to one another, but I still – I don't keep them more than, like, 20 per 10-gallon uh, tank. Okay. Um, so I make sure I keep – you know, their tank pristine weekly water changes definitely for both the tadpoles and the fish. Um, uh, yeah, and just offering them as high a quality of care as I would, you know, a pet fish. Lots of hides, lots of cover, high quality diet, because that's very important for your for your dragon snake, too. You right, want, yeah. you know, if, if the feeder is stressed and they're not eating or they're not being fed a high quality diet, well, they're not going to be as nutritious for the snake. So you definitely want to keep... Um, their aquariums and their tanks very, very clean. Um, and I always make sure that 
they're healthy and thriving. If there's a single like fish that I think that there's an issue with, I immediately quarantine them, treat them. Sometimes colonies, you know, if, if there's one sick fish in that colony, I will not feed that off that whole colony and just let them grow up and live lives as non feeder fish. But yeah, definitely gotta, gotta keep close, uh, um, closely monitor your feeder colonies for sure. Yeah, that's, I'm, yeah, I'm certainly learning that. I'm like, oh, no wonder why everyone told me that breeding these guys are a pain. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's going to be a struggle your first couple of times. It is. Oh, it was for me. <laughs> it was for me. And there, and you'll learn a lot, just like you do about, you know, anything, really. Establishing the feeder, there's a lot that I learned, um, like, you know, with the feeder fish, um, I tried feeding minnows before attempted to compensate because minnows um, are known minnows, goldfish as well, along with various other fish. But minnows and goldfish, which are probably the most easy to actually purchase as yeah. feeder fish, you know, and definitely the least expensive. They uh, they're known for a higher thiaminase content, um, significantly higher to where you wouldn't want to feed them to a snake. So I tried to kind of experiment and see if maybe I could uh, supplement thiamine into their diet to maybe counteract that in the, you know, that was that was a, a while ago now. But uh, <laughs> I thought that maybe it would work, but then came the realization that uh, with the fish actually having thiaminase kind of in their system it, it just breaks it right down once it's once they're consumed regardless if you supplement or not even with when you supplement it i try to supplement it for the dragon snakes and it's really just better to avoid with dragon snakes anyway avoid feeding a uh, diet consisting heavily of fish well you know right. like i said just maybe like two a few times a month um, not much more than that, just to make sure that they're getting the nutrition they need. Because, again, their body condition is pretty sensitive. So you want to make sure that they're getting the best diet as, as you can possibly provide. Yeah. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. So um, you touched on it quite a bit, a little bit, but we definitely specified more with the dragon snakes. Um, you've worked with quite a few different species of wild-caught imports. Mm -hmm. um, have you noticed a let me let me rephrase that is there a big difference in how you quarantine how you keep how you interact with wild caught animals versus captive born and bred here in the states absolutely and it definitely depends on the individual species um my mm -hmm. dragon snakes for example um them in particular i don't do um i guess it will be considered a standard quarantine in the sense where you know bare bones, paper towel, and maybe uh, a hide or something, a water right. dish. I, from the start, I give them moss, uh, sphagnum moss, um, hides, cover, a little bit of leaf litter, et cetera, stuff like that. That is kind of the bare bones quarantine. And then all my quarantine animals, my wild caught snakes are kept in a completely different room than the captive ones. And then the quarantined wild caught snakes are kept in a different room than the non quarantine wild caught snakes. Um, yep. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, obviously I'm very, um, uh, what's the word? I'm, I'm really careful about, uh, cross contamination and I want to make sure that all of the, all of our snakes, you know, keep, if, if the wild caught snakes have anything going on, I want them to keep it to themselves and not spread it to any of our other animals, of course. But, um, yeah, with quarantining wild caught snakes, it really depends on the species. It's definitely a different protocol because with the wild caught snakes, you know, in the wild, they wouldn't really be encountering a, a small, relatively small confined space with paper towels, a water dish and, you know, maybe a, a right. plastic hide or something like that. You know, they're uh, you want to make them as comfortable as possible. So um, like with my paradise flying snakes, when uh, I get them you know, fresh imports. I give them, uh, um, I give them sphagnum moss as like the bottom of their enclosure. They have usually a vertical enclosure. I give them climbing enrichment, but instead of using like wood, I'll use like PVC pipe so they can still climb as they want to, but it's, you know, I can disinfect it if I have to. Right. And then, um, once they're established, I usually quarantine wild caught snakes for a minimum of 180 days, six months. Yeah. Um, so I quarantine them for about 180 days at the minimum. And then, uh, and then I'll slowly kind of add more and more enrichment for them because um, uh, enrichment's important. We give all of our snakes, you know, appropriate enrichment for them. But, yeah, definitely quarantine uh, with wild-caught snakes is, is a bit different. And it does depend on the individual species because there's some that are incredibly sensitive to change while others, 
um, are aren't as much. They can tolerate a bit more, but that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, mm-hmm. I know you said that you had briefly worked with a species of Patias. Yes. Yep. A Patias nigra marginata. I I oh, hope cool. I'm pronouncing that right. I'm uh, probably doing better than me. I can't <laughs> say that right now. Um, but their uh, uh, their common name is really well, like any green rat snake. It's their uh, uh they can be called the black bordered green rat snake or a green rat snake. Um, but I worked briefly with those. I had a pair. I eventually sold them to focus on the dragon snakes, but they were very interesting species. You don't come across them very much. Um, there has been uh, a few people that have captive bred them now, but they were, oh, it was, it was, she was, uh, the pair I had was beautiful. The female I had, especially, they were very interesting, um, very arboreal, um, high humidity, um, love to bask in low heat. They were very interesting. Right. Did you ever work with the Coronados? The have really? not the monsters haven't want to though i see so much on them and i've been recommended to keep them and i i want to i definitely that's definitely in the plans for the future they're an awesome species they're they're definitely one of the ones on the list right they seem just like so variable too like mm-hmm. even almost more so than almost like a corn snake or like a dion's rat mm-hmm. they're yeah so they're cool. really cool they are they're super super cool really cool so <clears throat> Like, how many different species – well, look, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to get this to flow very well, and I'm still working on that, and I'm still – You're good. I'm, I'm a little hopped up on uh, cold medicine right now because I have <laughs> this and I you're have good. presentations this weekend. Um, but when you're dealing with all these different species that all require different husbandry, different diets, different approaches, does that really – have to make you focus more on individual species than just kind of trying to cast a wider net or do you try to dial one in first and then sorry to cut you off oh no you're good um uh so the way uh that i we basically started um i guess exploring various different species we keep primarily colubrids um, and then, you know, like oddball families like dragon snakes are in, you know, the Zemodermidae family and sunbeam snakes are another one that we keep that are in their own uh, Xenopeltidae uh, family. Um, and then we do have a couple boas and pythons. We used to keep uh, a bunch of different, we still do keep a wide variety of snakes, um, but we have definitely honed our focus um, on kind of two different, I'll say three, I'll say three different, I guess, uh a groups of snakes where we have our more exotic or rare species like the dragon snake, a paradise flying snake, sunbeam snake. So we have those, those kind of have, I don't want to say they have similar husbandry requirements, but generally, you know, high humidity, they're all Southeast Asian snakes. Um, obviously very different, you know, specific care requirements, but you know, relatively same formula in terms of, you know, they're Southeast Asian snakes. Then we have um, our more, I guess, exotic colubrids, which would be our Kribos, indigos, false water cobras, um, uh, those kind of species, uh, transpecos rat snakes, I guess you could kind of group them into an uncommon category. And then we do have a few species of boas and pythons. We have Colombian and Brazilian rainbow boas and sand boas. And then we have ball pythons. We used to keep Burmese pythons. Um, we decided not to breed those just for uh, personal like reasons. And then obviously, like you know, we're we're very um, adamant on providing the highest standard of care possible. We want to make sure that we can provide as much space and enrichment for every one of our snakes, from hatchlings to you know our big eight foot indigos um, that are you know in their own large enriching enclosures. And we just felt that we we couldn't offer that kind of level of care with the Burmese pythons and their hatchlings just due to, you know, obviously cost and their size and and whatnot. But yeah, we have, we've definitely um, have a huge variety of snakes that we kept, Um, especially when we first got into snakes. uh, We kept a various different uh, beauty rat snakes like Vietnamese blue beauties, uh, bamboo rat snakes. That uh, that Patias is a uh, uh, Asian rat snake, but um and then eventually we kind of honed in, you know, we still keep king snakes, corn snakes, your uh, basic, relatively basic rat snakes, North American colubrids. Right. But, um, but yeah, we're kind of into a little bit of everything. Uh, okay. There's so many different snakes and so many different personalities that in each snake that we absolutely love. So we definitely have uh, quite, quite a wide variety of them that we keep, but it's a good time. Yeah, it absolutely is. Yeah. It's, I do have a, 
I, I do find it very envious of people that can kind of find their niche and then they like really dial in on those very specific ones that really cater their passions. But I'm over yeah. here like this and that, and this and that. And this. <laughs> I think and I don't figure it out from there. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's OK to do both, though. I've always been into and still am always kind of evolving into various different things. I think one can be good at many things where, you know, we can put a lot of focus into the dragon snakes. And, you know, if we if we have to, um, you know, uh, do away with some species that we used to work with that are maybe a little bit more taxing and care, maybe they require a little. Uh, a good example would be we used to keep hog noses, Western hog noses. Right. And, um, you know, they're they're adorable little things. But yeah, we decided sure. to do away with those only because, you know, their babies can be a little taxing to get started to eating. Yeah. Um and then they're also evolving kind of uh, uh, there's there's so many morphs out there and we were kind of behind in the game. So we felt that, well, you know, we'll, we'll kind of let them, you know, the hobby like they have their hog nose breeders and we'll just kind of focus on these more rare snakes or uh, the snakes yeah. that we really, really enjoy keeping that, you know, like a king snake where they basically come out of the egg wanting to eat your face off. So that's nice. Yep. <laughs> That's definitely true. Mm-hmm. Like when you when you were talking about your first MBK, I was very jealous. I'm like, man, mine are mine are the worst. Like I've I've actually been the person who's been chased across the room by those things. <laughs> yeah, and, and it, it's funny because I mean, of course, Apophis, our first um, our first snake, Mexican black king snake. He he was the most and still is the most gentle, kind, friendly snake. Then we have another Mexican black king snake who we fittingly named Nemesis, who, I mean, <laughs> if you walk within 10 feet of her enclosure, she's, like, attacking the enclosure. I, I mean, I get her out, and I already know, well, I'm going to get bit today. And she she is definitely a feisty one. There's, there's definitely – the king snakes definitely have their – well, all snakes have their own personalities, but the yeah, king snakes, oh, gosh – Man, yeah, sometimes, like, when the little babies hatch, some of them are so sweet. The other ones are like, yeah, I'm probably going to eat you for lunch. So they're yeah. they're funny. <laughs> they're really funny. That's hilarious. Um, I know I didn't send you this one uh, prior to, but I'm kind of curious because, like, in the state that we have, we can't really keep rear fanged. Mm-hmm. Um, how are the Paradise Flying Snakes? Oh, they are, they're wonderful. They are, um, definitely not a handleable. Well, right. Well, you know, the, they're, they're really arboreal, um, and not handleable in the sense where, like, even if they were even captive bred, they're just not really into that. They're, um, relatively fragile. They're called flying snakes because they, uh, their ribs actually, they'll expand their, their ribs in order to glide across the air, and they literally, like, glide like a, like a, like a tree glider it's really really neat to see um not not that i've seen it i mean i've seen i've seen it in videos but you know right. in captivity it's kind of difficult to give them like 300 feet of room to to do so but um I was gonna ask if you ever like try to do in, like an enrichment thing where you get them to have like a little yeah or something. i know and that honestly that's like that's like one of our other like future plans we eventually want to be able to give because they don't get very big um the females usually don't get much bigger than about four feet maybe and they're pretty thin but um but we eventually want to give them like basically their own room so where they can i do want to witness that i want to replicate that in captivity one day but um but yeah they're definitely not a handleable snake but they are so fun to keep they are if you just like looking at snakes they are out all day 24 7 basking under their light all up in their all up in their vertical space and they are ferocious eaters they eat anoles um primarily house geckos um they can't eat uh I've seen some people offer like button quail and stuff, but we just feed we feed our uh ours uh anoles primarily and um we, we just source those from like our our pet store keeps a supply of them specifically for us. So we uh we get her our main paradise flying snake, she gets like about two anoles a week and man when they when they chow they're rear thing venomous but they also constrict and what she'll right. do is she'll she'll have her branch and she will be dangling all the way down from it and at the bottom she'll be constricting the lizard and you know be biting it and stuff and it's it's right. really cool to watch they're very fun to observe very fun to observe uh, I've, yeah i've noticed that like the semi-arboreal to arboreal snakes from you know like the like the genomus genus of like mm-hmm. the red tail rats and the yep. and the rhinos to 
even some of like the Morelli and stuff they like just their their behavior and their different like basking behavior you can see it and just really like watch them a little bit mm-hmm. better it seems like much Absolutely. more interactive to where it's definitely that yeah. kind of like hands-on versus display species absolutely yeah they are our paradise flying snakes they are always out during the daytime the only time they're not is when they're in shed and then they'll kind of climb into their log of course but but man when they're out they're always out and they uh even the wild caught ones they're not scared of humans she'll she doesn't mind i'll go right in her uh, enclosure and sometimes i'll fill up a little um like a little syringe with water and she'll let me like like base, she'll basically drink water from the syringe. Or she, you know, That's she's, really cool. Yeah, she's really, yeah, she's really, really good around people, and she's uh, got. They have their own personalities. Um, again, not not handleable, but you develop a bond with them at a distance. It's they're they're right. awesome. They're one of my favorite species to keep for sure. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm I'm kind of curious because, like I said, I don't really know anything about them. Do they have like a particular like defense or threat posture? Like, you know how a lot of them will threat, like, they'll flatten out their necks and do stuff like that. Do they do anything because they already naturally just kind of flatten out? Well, you could say that whenever it depends. If you're, they're <laughs> kind of, they're kind of, um, they're more flighty where if they feel threatened, they'll, you know, they'll just basically, like, they're, right. fr- they're fast. They'll bolt out of there. When, for the times I have had to hold her for, um, you know, especially when I first got her, you know, just for general, like, uh, uh, health check and stuff. When you're holding them, they'll just keep, they'll, they'll flail around, they'll bite you, they'll, they'll do anything they can. They're really, really quick, really flighty. Um, they're very good at escaping. Um, fair. (laughs) Yeah, they're, they will escape, do anything to escape your grass. When they bite you, I've, um, I've never, I don't think I've ever been envenomated by them. I have been by false water cobras, but. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I don't think she's ever envenomated me. And if she has, it was nothing. Um, their their venom is, you know, known to be medically insignificant. Mm-hmm. But um, but yeah, they are definitely more of an escape artist. She uh, when she's threatened, she just pretty much just gets the heck out of there. She doesn't really have a much of a threat display. Um, okay. She might flatten out a little bit her body. Um, right. if she's getting kind of like timid but yeah when she's scared uh when any of them are scared they'll they'll just kind of bolt off and get out of there so makes sense mm-hmm. well since we you brought up the freshwater the false water cobras i was gonna move on to that anyway as well so that's another rear fang species only in south america it's significantly larger mm-hmm. is how is just like kind of just general care for them. It's one of the few that I haven't actually had a chance to actually work hands on with. So false water cobras are probably, um, they are an amazing species. The very first, or no, one of the first false water cobras I ever had uh, was false water cobra named Legion. Um, (laughs) He was, he was, he was amazing. He was like, I mean, I don't, I try not to anthropomorphize things, but he was a cuddly snake per se in the sense right. where him and I just had a, a, a bond I guess you know a, a really close where you know I know they say reptiles don't have feelings and whatnot yeah. of, of course you know maybe they don't you know I'm not going to say that they're madly in love with anything but I do think they experience you know they associate comfort and um, security with mm-hmm. certain humans I you know to me that's kind of their own form of love but uh, Legion was incredibly incredibly special very sweet he rarely hooded up unless he had a, a, a like a, a mouse you know then he's like all right I'm going to eat the crap out of that right. but uh, he he was awesome um and then you have others like his mate and the two youngsters that I have. And when the lavender false water cobras, a morph of false water cobra, when they were younger, they were explosive. Um, they will rip some of them. The babies especially are kind of nuts. The juveniles, um, they are, yeah, they're definitely, they can be a little more explosive. That was the uh, the one time that I was envenomated by a juvenile false water cobra. It was, it was painful in the sense of a snake bite i mean i could literally i could feel the actual my finger swelled up the but but they're not you know it's not Mm -hmm. it went away after three days but their care um i'd say it's intermediate uh their husbandry is 
it, uh, you know, depending on, you know, species you cared for before, they need relatively high humidity, but because they do, um, they defecate quite a bit. They, yeah. uh, they have to eat more. Um, usually a varied diet. I offer them mouse uh, or mice, rodents, you know, chicks, uh, occasionally like little chicken bits along with other food items. You know, you always right. make sure they're eating whole prey, but, um, but yeah, their their husbandry is uh you know again moderate humidity, lots of ventilation, uh you know make sure that you're maintaining a very clean enclosure as you with any snake. Um, he is relatively average. They do like to bask a little bit in about you know probably about 85, 88 degree basking spot okay. around there. Um, they absolutely love to climb. They love to climb. Some of them are horrible at it. Some of them are just not good at climbing, but <laughs> they still try and they'd love it. They love climbing enrichment, um, big water basin. That's, you know, enough for them to like soak in really comfortably and deep. Um, young, younger ones can be kept in, you know, like bins if, you know, if you want to keep in a bin or something like that. But the the larger adults, you know, females can get around eight foot. They, right. they, can, get, they can get, yeah, they can get pretty big. So definitely need to accommodate their size. They are one of the species that are kind of like Kribos and Indigos in the sense where you want to give them as much space as you possibly can because they are very curious, very active. Um, and they really need a lot of space in order for them to thrive both, you know, in, in uh, captivity and, you know, in their environment. So that way they have enough like stimulation, mental stimulation. Right. Um, but yeah, they, and they grow quick. I mean, they are probably the fastest growing snake I have ever worked with. They, the juveniles, they start out, they hatch out about that big, about, about yay big. Mm -hmm. And then within a year, they'll be like, I can't even fit it on the screen here. But <laughs> they get huge, really, really quick. So you know, if you're acquiring a false water cobra, they start out this big, but it, it'll be less than a year before they're going to need a four foot enclosure. It's they grow up really, really quick. But um, almost like but, a retake growth rate or something. Yeah, yeah, it's really, really fast. Yeah, that's a good that's a good comparison. You know, obviously they don't reach you know that big. Well, no, yeah, they, do, they do grow. Yeah, the the growth rate is it's pretty it's really quick. It's mind blowing how quick they grow. Um. I mean, I, I don't want to get too, too controversial, but have you seen the scaleless falsies? I have. Um, I'm personally not, uh, not, I guess, interested in scaleless, just personal preference. Again, right. you know, not to get too controversial, but um, yeah, I have seen them, uh, little traces of them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I definitely prefer the scaled, the scaled right. ones. They're definitely I'm my, my favorite. I'm just kind of curious as to like how well those do considering how arboreal they are and how often they spend mm -hmm. in the water. Yeah. Like, yeah. They spend a good amount of time just soaking in the water. Absolutely. Right? Oh yeah, they do. And I mean, it's, you know, you have some that soak more than others. Um, I have a couple like my juveniles They the, some of them when they like when they were younger, they would soak like almost 24 seven. And then as they get older, you know, some of them, you know, soak a little less than others, but, um, and that's just an individual like preference for them. Right. But yeah, the scale is what I would what I would personally be curious to see how how that I guess worked out was with them soaking, you know, their skin is all, you know, it's hydrated and right, more yeah. you know, kinda like when you come out of the, the shower and you're all pruned up, you can get a cut pretty easy. And their nature where, you know, they should really be offered enrichment that they can climb on and perch on and check out and especially with them being more kind of a they like to bask on occasion and such. Um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't uh, stayed up to date on the scaleless, but I would be curious to see how those babies kind of, how that affects them um, in the future for sure, because um, they are a very active snake. They're not stationary by any means, and they're, they're pretty crazy. They, you know, they'll tail whip you if it, when you're feeding them. They're pretty crazy. I would worry about skin breakage for sure, but yeah. again, I don't, I don't have personal experience keeping them, so. I can't, um, I can't, I can't say, but I have thought about, I have thought about, uh, those aspects of, you know, that particular, uh, variation. Yeah. That always just kind of like, I understood to a degree of like the different rat snakes, <clears throat> mm -hmm. but, but like that one always just kind of like, Oh, you just kind of set it up to more of like a subtropical animal and then you give it a little mm -hmm. bit smoother enrichment versus yeah. like actual natural wood or cork bark and you're mm -hmm. fine. Yeah. But, 
yeah, just like the actual animal itself, like there's so much variation in individually mm-hmm. and for different species where that just seems like that's just kind of I can see why we haven't seen too many of those. Yeah, it definitely gives <laughs> food for thought with false water cobras. And me, I think my main concern would be because they do. They're uh, one of the few species that like really tail whip. And I mean, where some of them, they'll be really food motivated, really excited to eat. So if you walk past their enclosure, especially the younger ones, you know, they might tail whip while you're just walking by. And when they tail whip, it is like, I mean, it's a it's well, I can't I can't mimic the sound, apparently, right. but it, it's a big smack. And I would worry that, um again, no personal experience keeping them. So, I you know, I'm not sure. But I have thought about, you know, if they were to tail whip and it hit the side of their enclosure, that could pose, you know, a problem right. uh, for, for injury. But. Um, again, just, uh, that's all, uh, I guess, uh, educated speculation, if you will. Yeah, that's basically what's happening. Um, I will say though, um, because you brought up tail whipping a couple times, uh, because I would imagine that most people, because a lot of kind of like entry level people listen to this podcast, Mm -hmm. um, to intermediate level, I should say, um, a lot of people when think tail whipping, they think of like iguanas and monitor lizards. It's tail whipping is a defense Yes. Mechanism. Yeah. Um, yeah. And with false water cobras, um, there is a uh, feller named uh, Zach Lofman who just recently wrote a huge uh, book on various um, species of snakes. And in there, though, is a 50 uh, page chapter on false water cobras. He oh, has wow. he yeah, he's um, he is uh, a great um, uh, person to actually look into for. That like for the studies of false water cobras, because he has uh, he uh, works at a university and has studied them in in great depth. And um, in terms of their tail whipping behavior, I can't quite recall. I I think part of it is defensive. I think another part of it is perhaps a predatory hunting behavior, but I can't quite recall off the top of my head. But he he if if, um, for really detailed information on them, Zach Laughlin, he is absolutely great with pretty much every knowledge of false water cobras. Um, really good, really good dude to check out for all that. He's done a lot of work with them. So I always like to get into that people who work with different specific species. Like I'm sure a lot of people are probably more familiar with <clears throat> like the different people who work with, like some of the Liasis and the Morelia people. Um, but mm-hmm. not too many people know about a lot of the different oddball colubrid. Specials. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he uh, he's one. And then there's another guy named uh, Kyle Wilson, who's also uh, he he breeds oh, tons yeah. of yeah, tons of false water cobras. He's another one that's uh, really I mean, of course, we work with them. We have a few groups. But um, mm-hmm. honestly, because uh, what happened with my uh, uh, false water cobra legion, um, uh, I had actually for the first time ever uh, fed a fresh killed chick to him. And unfortunately, unbeknownst to me, uh, the chick who um, I acquired from a local farmer that, uh, you know, he keeps them outside and whatnot. Um, unfortunately, that chick had capillaria, which is a, a, par- a parasitic nematode. Uh, ended up, uh, Legion, the false water cobra, he ended up getting sick from it. I took him to the vet immediately, but those that, that type of nematode, they manifest very, very quickly. Um, and unfortunately, we couldn't save him. Um, and he passed away uh, in uh, January uh, 9th of 2021, just last year. Um, and that loss was really, really difficult on me. Probably the hardest loss I've experienced with any animal because he was really a brilliant snake. And after that, I kind of, um, I don't want to say that I, I stopped keeping all like, a, I stopped acquiring, I guess, false water covers, but now we only have our uh, lavenders and a, and a few youngsters that we're going to unrelated youngsters that we're going to, you know, raise up. But, um, yeah, they kind of have a, this bittersweet feeling to me right now. That's all just, you know, overcoming the loss and whatnot, but yep. Definitely feeling on that one for sure. Mm-hmm. If, <clears throat> well, not to go down that rabbit hole, which can always lead to not great decisions down the road. Let's talk about um, something that you've been working on for a while. Like when I first approached you, what, back in probably the beginning of July, yeah. not being a guest on a podcast, you were right in the middle of a really big project that you were working on and you just yeah. wrapped up on it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's called My Snake Crate. And um, it's basically a monthly subscription box that 
where it's geared towards, um, you know, children and youth and their parents, where um, every box has a new snake to learn about every month. And um, I'm pretty much the sole content creator behind everything. Uh, all the artwork, um, the there's an individual line of booklets on each individual snake species that I put together. Um, all that stuff, art activities, um, lots of really, really cool stuff, all the photos and everything. Um, it's, uh, taken me, you know, quite, quite, quite some time to get everything together. Still working on a little bit, like some, putting some other, like, final details together. But yeah, my snake crate, um, we're looking forward to launching it, uh, by December of this year. So we're really excited for that. We have some pre-orders in, and the first box is actually going to be on dragon snakes, and it'll have a little, like, dragon snake, like, figurine it'll have um you know a booklet on them and basic cool. general general information on them photos um a little uh, coloring book on them that kind of stuff it'll have all sorts of really really neat stuff and uh we have content planned out for the next year so we're really excited to get that launched to get that going mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's really, really cool. exciting that's, i love that that's really cool it's i'm always trying to figure out different things i can do for like when I go to like reptile shows or do presentations for younger kids, I always try to find something for that to get them really excited. And that's yeah. really cool because at that point they can even get into those species specific ones too. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's, it's neat. Cause uh, Oh, it has posters too. That's what, that's what else is really cool. But um, yeah, all the content, I tried to really make it uh, so that way every box has content, you know, where, all the information and everything comes right here from from our own family of you know snake keepers right. um and uh it's it's been really really fun putting everything together especially like the books uh, i have a little daughter who's five years old she just uh entered kindergarten she absolutely i kind of put together a little mock crate for her and she absolutely loved it and i'm really excited to kind of see where it takes off and we have a lot of uh, other plans for it that I'll, d I'll definitely cool. disclose later later on in time, but yeah, we're really excited for it. And one of the that's really cool. Yeah, one of the more fun projects for sure. Are there is there a way for people to like go onto your website to get yeah. a pre order? Yeah, so um, we have our website uh, is uh, mysnakecrate.com, just exactly okay. how it sounds, you know, my snake and then crate. Uh, and if you go right on there, there is um, some pretty easy to navigate tabs. It'll say subscribe. You go right on there. We have four different types of crates. There is um, the mini crate, so to speak, where it has uh, just um, it's kind of like a, I guess you'd call it like a, a demo of you know the larger crate where you can kind of get a feel for what you're getting it has like a booklet it'll have the little figurine and a sticker and stuff and then there's the standard crate which has uh one of every there's a bunch of like seven or eight different really cool items in there and then uh there's like a, a family and a sibling crate where you know if you have a uh, you know, if you want multiple booklets or posters or anything right. like that, you know, if you have a larger family, you can get something for everybody cool. in uh, the crate. So, yeah, yeah, the website has all the information on it, has um, all the uh, all the order information. You can subscribe right there to it and get the, the Dragon Snake pre-order has to be ordered before. Oh, I will have to push the deadline, but um, by the end of or by the first of November. Okay. So to get the Dragon Snake. But, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's really cool. I'll try to, I'll, I'll, I, at the end of every one, I always end for, um, for the, for the video that I'll put out on YouTube, I always do links of, um, whatever guests or whatever it is. So we'll make sure to put Creatures of Nightshade as well as My Snake Crate. So I awesome. can go check you. that out really too. I appreciate that. And, oh, yeah, um, absolutely. uh, the other, uh, the other one that I, um, that I do because I kind of kind of delve into like pretty much everything, but Fair. I started, um, a separate page. I do, uh, Logos primarily for just because of my ties to the reptile community. I do logo uh, logo commissions primarily for uh, reptile keepers, but um, I'm branching out and I started my own page called Nightshade uh, Natura, which is Nightshade and then N A T U R A. Um, it's just a Facebook page for right now, but it basically just encompasses uh, art art related things, uh, commissions. I do pet portraits, obviously logos, anything, really anything you can think of. So. Yeah, cool. some some more art stuff and just kind of expanding as I get into more and more things. Yep, that's always you always find a way to give yourself a future headache is what I like yeah. to describe it. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. That's a really good way of putting it because I I get into so many different um 
aspects of I, I just I love doing everything, everything that I can, always learning. Yeah. Um, well, uh, with that in mind, are there anything that you would like to see kind of come up in the reptile community as a whole or something that um, you personally with either yourself or with any of your different projects or, you know, um, anything that you're doing that will hopefully kind of change or something you'd like to see happen in the reptile community in the, in the near to distant future? Absolutely. Um, I, I have always, ever since, uh, you know, we started keeping snakes, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, our biggest, our biggest thing was to always ensure that our animals come first, you know, always making sure that we don't ever sacrifice their health and happiness for our own personal gain. It's our animals always come first. And I would really, I really like, um, I'm kind of seeing a bit of a, I guess you could say a shift, um, in the right direction. I, I would like, I like seeing like, uh, um, even bar check again, not to get too controversial, but you know, with the reptarium, with the bigger enclosures and such, mm -hmm. Um, I definitely like, uh, I guess, focusing on the the individual snakes. Like when we have, whenever we post uh, snakes that we have available, for example, I uh, take the time to kind of get to know the individual, every little hatchling, and I'll post their personality traits, their handleability, um, and then I have like a little funny tagline. Like I, for one of our corn snakes, I had that he's destined to be the next Tom Brady. Just weird, <laughs> weird, funny, quirky stuff, but. Um, I would like to see maybe breeders focusing on individual snakes and their preferences, um, whatever that may be. Um, you know, I, I've, you know, we make a living, you know, from our snakes, of course, but, right. but it, it was more, to, you know, to maintain the fact that we love working with them and our animals, we always view them as, you know, our, our animals and we love them dearly. And, um, yeah, I definitely think, uh, I would like to see a, a shift, um, and there is, there is an ongoing shift, but definitely focus on, you know, make, providing enrichment um, and such for our snakes, even if, you know, it's something as little as a little branch or something, just for them, you know, encouraging mental stimulation, right. stuff like that, um, a lot of uh, behavioral uh, um Things are being done. Uh, a, a girl named Lori Torini, she has her own uh, yep. channel. Yeah, behavior education. She's done great work with um, a lot of her animals, and I like that. That's the kind of direction I like mm -hmm. to see us evolving, always evolving our care and husbandry. So, Absolutely, yeah, that's really great. She actually was uh, the last guest that we had on, too. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Which I was, un like, I had, I had heard of her in circles and, and learning about all the different really cool stuff she was doing, and then I learned, oh, hey, she's in – She's in Colorado too, so I'm like, oh, hey. mm -hmm. yeah, she's awesome. She works with a lot of different animals. She's one of my definitely one of my favorite people to follow. I love her work. She's oh, she's yeah. great. I was gonna say, have you done any sort of target training or stationing or anything with any of your animals? I know you've done some puzzle boxes. Yeah. Um. So uh, we, I did do, a, I did start doing a little bit of target training. Um. I just for whatever reason or another, I don't. I think I just kind of kept forgetting about it to be honest. Where, uh, um, yeah. yeah, where I'm like feeding the snakes. I'm like, oh man, I wanted to target train. So what I decided to do with the, um, and I do still. I've been working on the puzzles with uh various different snakes but blackjack was the one i had the most success with where he had that advanced food puzzle and he went right to town tried it on false water cobras both youngsters and adults they are not i had one that kind of got it but they got kind of frustrated um my female eastern indigo is the same way where she uh kind of started getting the hang of it but i think she kind of got frustrated she's like man i just want to eat the, the freaking mice like don't why are you making yeah. me solve a puzzle um, but yeah, I, I'm definitely very interested in, um, evolving that kind of stuff, you know, doing more of that a lot more because it's, they're, it's crazy what they can accomplish. I mean, when Blackjack, like he saw, he nailed that, that initial puzzle and he still does. I, uh, have a few more that I've done. I just, I need to get a video of it, but, but yeah, I just been so busy, but he is amazing with, he blows me away. Um, he's definitely the, uh, the other, the female indigo that we have, she's been able to get through some more simple ones where the, all she has to really do is kind of nudge this little like cup thing and it mm -hmm. flips over in the food. She can do the simpler ones, but yeah, still, still working with her though. I think snakes, you know, just like people is that intelligence, you know, evolves. I think the more that they're challenged, the more that they yep. may be capable to, to, to meet the challenge and complete it. So. Absolutely. 
Um, and then there's something that I did forget to ask uh, when we were still talking about dragon snakes. So um, still learning to do the flow a little bit better. So learning together. Um, have you noticed? Um, have you attempted to do any breeding with the dragon snakes? Yeah. So um, so last year, I think it was last year. Yeah, it was last year. The last um, couple, you get a pass. For sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the last year, uh, or last year, um, I kind of going back into overcomplicating things. I was initially because there are breeding conditions in Indonesia, well, Southeast um, um, Asia, but uh, get primarily Indonesia. Um, where they're from, they breed during the monsoon season, which in Indonesia is between November and about March, uh, February, okay. March of the next year. Um, and, uh, you know, snakes have a pretty keen sense for barometric pressure. So I was trying to initially make a chamber, so to speak, to, min- to mimic the monsoon season where, I, you know, I fill it, you know, with moisture. And I was trying to like I had a uh, I don't even know what it's called anymore. It was some like HVAC thing that took the air out to create negative pressure because mm-hmm. the barometric pressure drops during a storm and whatnot. But um I kind of had it going and then I realized that ironically um, our equivalent to the monsoon season here where we have the same exact barometric pressure drop is um, at a different time of year. It's usually between uh, what month is it right now? September. So October until about February. So what I'm going to try to do rather than overcomplicating it and assuming that there's a breeding chamber, I am actually going to uh, house mine communally in a large enclosure and okay. kind of kind of let them just, you know, court each other, whatever it is that they want to do um, in that aspect. I did have a gravid, what I believe to be a gravid female last year. Um, she she I could I palpated her. You could feel there was a couple because they lay small clutches, right. usually no more than uh, two to four eggs at a time. Excuse me. Very good. And um. And I did palpate her. I, I could definitely feel lumps, but um, I think she absorbed the the eggs for whatever reason. I think it was perhaps, um, you know, because I was moving them in between the breeding chamber and whatnot. It was probably stress related on on my behalf, you know. But you know, got to live and learn. But yeah, I do think I, I have a, a lot of hopes for this year. I'll be pairing them um, about the end of the month. Uh, we are very male heavy right now, so. Um, I'm actually going to be, uh, I set up an application on our website, but I'm actually going to be selling a few of our established males that we've had for a couple of years um, to people that fill out the application. And if they're interested, you know, I'm going to do a really thorough analysis of the new keeper. But, but yeah, nice. we're trying trying to get, uh, you know, sell our males to, to some good people that have been looking to keep the species and then uh, eventually, you know, getting a few more females to add in. So it's, 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 uh, it's a slow progress, but we're, we're definitely working on it, hoping that uh, within the next couple of years we'll experience some captive bred offspring because I think they would be just a joy to keep I and mean, much yeah. easier. I was going to say, yeah, from what you were saying about the little tiny ones that came in that it seemed to establish a little bit better. Yeah, and I think the thing is, like, because um, with the wild-caught dragon snakes, the biggest factor is stress. They're very, right. very easy to stress. And, again, you know, if you overcomplicate their care or if you get, you know, uh, vet visits are a big, you know, something to avoid, over-medicating, um, checking on them too frequently, stuff like that, stressing them out. That is what's going to make them to, you know, refuse to eat, as we mentioned earlier, on top of the entire importation process, which is an absolute disaster. Um, I only ever get fresh, fresh imports. If they're older, if they've been under the unless it's a really like an importer I personally know is, you know, great with their care, which there's very few people that I, you know, but um for most of for most of the snakes that come from importers, if they're any older than a month. Um, into, into their care, into their care and, and in the importer's care, I usually don't, uh, acquire them from them just because after a month, you know, I don't trust that they've been eating with the importer most of the time, even if it's said that they were, um, you know, I, 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 yeah. Yeah. So I, but, uh, with the babies and even the little, little wild caught ones I have, they just, they, 
again, you would honestly think that the little babies I have were captive bred if you didn't know better because they, they're just so much different. They ate like, they're like, I don't know, right away. They're so healthy. They're growing up to be beautiful snakes. And I just got them, you know, a few months ago, um, this last batch of the little, with the little babies. And, um, I'm really impressed. It gave me a lot of hope that, you know, once we have the captive bred babies, in the future that they will be significantly easier to keep um, because they won't have that natural like, OK, they went through the import process and then they had this breeder and their body condition where, you know, they just basically fell apart. And it's kind of a right. gamble with any wild caught snake, but especially with dragon snakes. I think those little babies, when they're captive bred, I think that there's going to be a, a really good uh, shift where the captive bred babies are going to be just an absolute joy to keep and, you know, maybe even handle a little bit and stuff like that. Cause those babies are adorable. They're like, Oh, handling them is fun. I don't, I don't handle them too much, but um, the babies, but they, they are just, they're so sweet. They're cute little faces are like the size of my pinky nail and they're just, they're full of energy and they're, That's they're cool. great. Yeah. It's really exciting. That's awesome. Well, I don't want to keep you too long, so I try to keep it, like, right around that hour mm-hmm. mark. So um, thank you so much for, you know, giving me your time and being able to talk about these really cool species of snakes and all these really fun projects that you're going to be getting into to hopefully, you know, kind of spread it to the next generation as well. Yeah, thank you. It's been great. I had a great time talking about all of them. Oh, yeah, it's awesome. So um, for people who are listening slash and or watching, um, what is the best place to, you know, see what you're doing, keep up with what you're doing, or even contact you if they were interested in potentially um, going through the process of getting one of your established male, um, good Lord, <laughs> one of your male <laughs> snakes, or even other animals that you're breeding yourself uh, down the road. Yeah, so um, we have our website, which is creaturesofnightshade.com. Um, I'm very responsive to our emails. Um, our email address is on there. It's info at creaturesofnightshade.com. Um, if you look me up on Facebook, our, either our business, Creatures of Nightshade, or myself, uh, Scarlet Nightshade, I'm, I try to get back to everyone as much as I possibly can. Um, Facebook is probably the, the best place uh, to contact me directly or, or my email. Again, info at creaturesofnightshade.com. That's all on our website. Uh, you can submit a contact form through our website. Um, and if you, if, you know, people that are interested in applying for those male dragon snakes on our website, there is a tab that says at the top, it'll say more, and then it'll say dragon snake application. Um, uh, I'll be accepting applications until the 1st of October, and then I'm going to go through them all and kind of pick out, you know, I have, a, I, I think I have five more males that, uh, are going to be made available and they're well established. They're all eating good. All the information on them will be provided in extensive detail and stuff. So, but yeah, um, that's pretty much it. And then our YouTube channel, I'm working on adding more content. Um, uh, lately it's kind of been some silly stuff here and there. I kind of have like silly, like, uh, videos I like to put up every now and again, but I'm working on adding more content on there and just kind of, kind of getting everything done. Just have a lot going on, you know, a lot of projects, yep. but <laughs> as always. But cool. That was that's that was awesome. That was that was really cool. I love to be able to just learn more about very interesting and cool and especially oddball species and snakes too. Definitely a snake guy. Yeah, yeah, me too. I'm definitely definitely snake like loyal. Right. Cool. So thank you very much. Um I hope everyone enjoyed this episode. Um, you know, stay tuned for future episodes of the podcast or anything else like that. Um if you want to stay up to date, make sure to follow us on Instagram, on Facebook, on our YouTube channel that you're watching right now, obviously. Um, thank you again so much and hope everyone has having a great day. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. Thank you.